Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us at this Wednesday webinar from the Public Interest Technology University Network at New America. We're, today, we're going to talk about defining data literacy for first year college students. Uh, my name is Alberto Rodriguez. I'm the senior program manager at uh, the New America team in the PIT, U, in PIT U, UN. And this conversation about the PITLIT initiative, panels from Georgia State Universities and other inter-university partners will provide an overview of our program goals and gather feedback from panelists and you as to what constitutes data literacy for the public good. To get us started, let me introduce you to Mandy Swigert Hoba, team leader for research data services and co-director of the PITLIT initiative at Georgia State University. Mandy. It's all yours. Thank you, Alberto. And um, we're going to have a couple slides come up here. So I'm going to wait till the uh, screen gets shared before we begin. But welcome. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Namada. All right. So welcome, everyone, to this webinar. We're so glad you came. Um, before we get to the actual panel, uh, focused on data literacy for first year college students. We'd like to give a little bit of background on how we got to PIDLIT. So PIDLIT stands for <laughs> Public Interest Data Literacy, and this is our newest initiative. Um, as Alberto already said, I'm Mandy Swigert Hoba. I'm one of the uh, co directors of PIDLIT, and I'm the leader of the Research Data Services team at Georgia State University Library. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that team in a moment. And then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Brian Sinclair, who is also a co director of PIDLIT and is Associate Dean for Public Services at the Georgia State University Library. Next slide, please. So PIDLIT, this initiative, oops, can we go back one? We, we just skip one. Thank you. So the, the initiative is generously funded by New America as part of its Public Interest Technology University Network, or PIT-UN for short, of, of which our university, Georgia State University, is a member. So to tell you a little bit about PIT-UN, if you not, are not familiar with it, um, they foster collaboration between universities and colleges that are committed to the field of public interest technology and growing a new generation of civic minded technologists. So through the development of curricula, which is kind of our initiative focus, um, research agendas and experiential learning programs in this public interest technology space, pit Pitt UN universities are trying innovative tactics to produce graduates with these multiple fluencies of at the intersection of technology and policy and with the aim of using these fluencies for the public good. Next slide, please. So the Georgia State University Libraries Research Data Service Team, of which I am lead, was formed in 2016 in response to a perceived gap in cross-campus data services support. Next slide, please. The Research Data Services team um, offers data support services across the entire research life cycle, as we call it. So some of the areas that we support are including finding existing data and statistics, original data collection, data analysis tools and methods, mapping and data visualization, and data management. Next slide, please. So this um, slide view, it looks like it got a little messed up in the view, but that's okay. Um, it has a, it was a easy, supposed to be an easier view of the support areas and specific services that we offer. Um, the previous slide had a PDF flyer that was tiny and hard to see. But generally speaking, um, we wanted to highlight that of particular popularity is our support for quantitative and qualitative data analysis and visualizations tools, including proprietary software such as SPSS for statistical analysis, in vivo for qualitative analysis, Tableau for data visualization, but also open source um, tools like R and Python. Next slide, please. 
So generally speaking, the way our support kind of takes form is we have open workshops that anyone can attend. We also do course embedded sessions. We have custom sessions with research teams and we do one on one or group consultations. Next slide, please. So this slide has a lot of information on it, uh, but basically it's information about kind of breakdown of students using our data support services, um, graduates versus undergraduates. And if you look to the left, you'll see that we have no problem reaching graduate students as evidenced by this data on data consultations, workshop attendance, and course embedded sessions. Um, and this is not surprising given that graduate students and their faculty recognize this immediate need that graduate students have for data literacy skills because they have theses, they have dissertations that they have to complete. Um, but if you look to the right hand side, the undergraduate uh, data of our uh, on our data support services and the use by that group, you can see that um, you know we have a lower representation of undergraduates, and we would like to increase you know undergraduate interest. So this goal of just wanting to increase undergraduate interest in our data services, in part, has put us on this path to Pidlet um, because we want to get undergraduates engaged in developing more data literacy skills and particularly helping them recognize the value of these skills for their career marketability. Next slide, and I'll turn it over to Brian at this point as well. So thank you, Mandy. This is Brian Sinclair, uh, the co-director of PIDLIT and associate dean for public services, again, at Georgia State University Library. And we're very pleased to have you all here today to learn. So I'm going to continue you on your journey to PIDLIT. Um, we do these things that Mandy has described because we seek to empower students to be better researchers and critical thinkers to be successful in their academic pursuits and in their later careers. Our efforts around data literacy and research data services are aligned with a broader campus initiative called College to Career. A College to Career is a campus-wide effort that encourages students to recognize the career competencies they are, they are gaining through curricular and co-curricular activities and to both document and demonstrate those competencies before they graduate. Ultimately, the idea is to expand students' career horizons and make them more marketable to future employers. Next slide, please. So this got cut off a little bit, but no problem. The outcomes uh, are, are cut off there, but no, no worries. I just mentioned them. Students are to become aware, including in the first year of their college career, to make those connections between co-curricular curricular activities and what they're learning, and then ultimately demonstrate what they can do. And the um, on the right column, if it had been there, it's fine. There, uh, the competencies are listed, and one of the chief among them, I just mentioned it, is critical thinking. Um, and and among and in, in that uh, competency, working with data, visualizing data, analyzing data, understanding data is is a critical part of that. And we see ourselves as aligning with that. Next slide, please. So. Another way we are increasing awareness of data careers and helping to build connections between students and our local community is through this data in the ATL speaker series. We've been doing it for four years now, or we'll be starting our fourth year. It's hosted by the library and we bring in professionals from the community and the objectives are right there on the right. Introduce students to possible careers in data science, increase those connections, promote our efforts in supporting research and data, and to just share knowledge and get to know each other. Next slide, please. So we are fortunate to be based in Atlanta, in downtown Atlanta, actually, home to many Fortune 500 companies, entertainment and news organizations, and major nonprofit governmental and health organizations. The American Cancer Society is our neighbor here in downtown Atlanta. And of course, the CDC is here. Next slide. We've welcomed numerous data scientists, data analysts, and other professionals um, from the Atlanta area. Um, if, if the columns were showing, it would show all the nonprofits we've welcomed into the, uh, to, to the campus. Um, and uh, those have included uh, edu major educational, nonprofit um, uh, data analysts. And the whole idea is to introduce students to careers that might be in the nonprofit sector as well. Next slide, please. So, Here's just a few examples before I wrap up. 
with this. This is Mike, Mike Carnathan from the Atlanta Regional Commission, our regional planning agency for Metro Atlanta. Uh, through their research and his research in data analytics, they inform various intergovernmental partners on things like new transportation options, developing healthy livable communities, managing water resources, providing services for older adults and individuals with disabilities. This speaker series, which Mike was a part of, is very popular. Students are very interested in learning how they can apply what they're learning in the classroom around data in this case, or around making, it, making a map or GIS to possible career options that may not be, uh, they may not be aware of. So next slide, please. And this is Hannah Goldberg, Director of Research for the Georgia Early Education Alliance for Ready Students. Her team is developing a suite of online tools that empower citizens and decision makers to explore data around early childhood and school readiness. They've done some interesting things with interactive maps that show demand and gaps related to childcare in our metro area. Again, very well attended, not only by our College of Education students, by from students from various disciplines who are interested in learning, again, how can they apply what they're learning to real life or outside of college work. So next slide. And uh, students were able to learn and network with data professionals from different backgrounds in a wide array of contexts and in different settings. This is Thomas Price, data strategist for the Atlanta Public Schools, who spoke with us about his work with data visualization and statistical modeling for our local school district. Next slide. So the data literacy and skills training we provide through the library's research data services, plus the data in the ATL speaker series connecting students with real world application of data science, plus our alignment with the efforts of GSU's college to career initiative and our university's overarching commitment to preparing students for um, careers that can make a difference in the world is what brought us to Pidlet today. Um, we are committed to preparing thoughtful, critical thinking students for possible data careers by expanding programs to reach our first year students. We hope to encourage a career pipeline that is stronger and more diverse in terms of race, ethnicity, ability, gender, and socioeconomic status. And that's where you, our attendees today, and our panelists come in. Our panelists from GSU, NC State, and University of Cincinnati will help us today as we gather feedback from you all is what constitutes data literacy for the public good. Next slide, please. And before we begin, I'd like to recognize a few of our other partners and collaborators thus far, in addition to Pitt, UN, and New America. They're listed here today, and I believe we have representation from NC State and UC Libraries today. And uh, we'll be doing more workshops and webinars with our other partners as well. Next slide. And I'd like to introduce our host for today's main event, Ashley Rockwell, our inaugural Pit Lit Fellow. Um, Ashley, let me tell you a little bit about Ashley before she gets to uh, the questions for the panel. But she's originally from Washington State. She has undergraduate degrees in neuroscience and psychology from Washington State University. From there, she made her way to Atlanta, where she earned an MA in sociology and is presently com completing her PhD in sociology here at Georgia State. Her background includes working in public radio, among other things, which we think may be helpful to us as we, as we work to promote PIDLIT. Uh, her research interests are wide and varied. She has interests in uh, gender and work, gender in the media, empathy, race, gender and class inequalities, social problems, and community and urban sociology, just to name a few. Uh, next slide. So, I will turn it over to Ashley and thank you all for attending today. And thank you so much to our panelists and our colleagues at New America and Pitt UN. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. And thank everyone. Uh, thank you to everyone who's joined us today. I wanna start out with a chance to give our panelists um, the opportunity to briefly introduce themselves. And so I'm gonna go ahead and start uh, in alphabetical order by last name, <laughs> um, but uh, can uh, starting with the Concha, then Tiffany, Natalia, and Chad, can you tell me uh, about your position and how or why you got into data? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Akansha Angra, and I am an academic professional um, in the Department of Biological Sciences at Georgia State University. Um, and 
I got into data uh, and data literacy because of my graduate school work. Um, and, you know, I sort of started with when I was a undergraduate TA and I was teaching a biology laboratory course. And I realized that the students really struggled with making graphs and really thinking deeply about their data. And so I went on to graduate school to study this exact topic, um, how undergraduate students, graduate students, and uh, expert professors think about data and how they create graphs on pen and paper modality. Hi everyone, my name is Tiffany Grant. I work at the Health Sciences Library of the University of Cincinnati as the Assistant Director for Research and Informatics. Um, I'm in the libraries, but I have to say that I'm not a typical or traditional librarian. Um, my background is molecular biology, infectious diseases. Um, mainly a lot of that came about because of my interest. I came of age during the HIV AIDS um, time in the 80s and 90s. Um, and so, which actually led me to pursue um, a doctorate in pathobiology and molecular medicine. Um, and so I worked um, on that in a microbiology lab um, and went on to do a couple of postdocs and I also worked um, as a microbiologist. Um, I came full circle back to the University of Cincinnati, which is where I got my doctorate, um, to work as um, what was called at that point a research informationist. Um, the idea behind that was that they needed someone who would be able to translate the needs of the biomedical professionals um, within our academic health center into services that the library could offer. Um, and so in doing that um, for a couple of years, I actually became the assistant director where I now co-lead our research and data services. Um, the services that we offer are very similar to what you heard Mandy mention earlier. And so we do a lot of things that basically covers the entire gamut of the research or data life cycle from creating data management plans um, as individuals are applying for grant funding from different um, federal funding agencies, all the way down to or up to however you want to look at it to archiving the information for further and future use. And so that's um, in large part how I came into the, the data sphere, I'll say. Hi everyone, um, my name is Natalia Lopez. I am lead librarian for data instruction at North Carolina State University based in Raleigh. Um, and so prior to actually becoming a librarian, um, I was a nonprofit professional in New York City, um, worked in a number of organizations primarily focused on immigrant rights um, and education. Um, and so it was, it was during that time, honestly, that I kind of had to manage a lot of data and sort of collect a lot of data. Um, and found that I a, had a knack for it and also interest in it. It was really appealing to me to figure out how to sort of work on, on sort of tech problems and issues that really helped ultimately like the, the work we were doing. Um, and so I, when I went to library school, I ended up working at UNC Chapel Hill's um, Davis Libraries Research Hub, which is focused on data services. Um, and I really got sort of um, this like, I was like immersed in all these like methods and tools that I suddenly had learned. And I was so excited by this, the potential of it. Um, and thinking back to like my former colleagues and sort of what, what would have happened if I had been um, introduced to all these tools and methods when I was an undergrad. Um, and that really just kind of um, what became sort of a passion and, and how I then approached like librarianship. Greetings, everyone. My name is Chad Marchung. I am the Assistant Director of Learning Analytics in the Center for Excellence, Teaching and Learning and Online Education at CETLO um, at Georgia State University. Um, so uh, just a quick, uh, just to get a little bit personal, when I was a, a, a younger in high school, junior high school and things like that, I was a fairly decent math student. Um, and I was really excited about attending uh, some of the math classes. Sounds like there's, there's, there's a lot of passion with our, our panelists around data and, and things like that. Um, just to kind of quickly touch on some of the experiences that I had when I was a bit younger was that um, while I was, I was good at math, um, I, I was constantly being asked by my classmates to help them with some of the math subjects um, and help them tutor and things like that. But I was always frustrated by being able to uh, transfer some of that knowledge and tutor some of my um, 
uh, my classmates. Um, so ever since then, I always uh, felt like I needed to become better at supporting uh, my classmates and learners and things like that around uh, around math. And this is kind of you know what I, I'm so passionate and and, and um, excited about with this pit led initiative is where we do start to bring in uh, some of those ideas and get some of these students. Um, you know, changing their mindset around uh, some of the, the math and, and um, uh, you know, STEM subject matter areas. Um, but when I went to college, um, I decided to major in computer science. There was still a lot of math classes there. There was still a lot of abilities for me to, um, to use analytical skills and logical skills and things like that. After graduating college, um, I had numerous jobs before I eventually started into IT. And I've been at Georgia State University for 10 years now, had a number of IT related positions um, since starting here and mostly around learning technology. And more recently, um, about three years ago, starting off with uh, working with our learning analytics team um, and has been with this team ever since then. Um, this team was, uh, was, was, uh, was born or, or conceived from uh, some of the tremendous work that Georgia State has been doing around uh, student success and the use of data and just kind of extending on that with this learning analytics team. And um, so, so our team supports and uh, works with our faculty um, on using some of the data that's coming out of our teaching and learning systems. As you probably know, we're, we're a lot online now and there's a lot of data that's coming out of some of our teaching and learning systems. So we're using that to help and, and provide services for our faculty. So that way they can um, take a look at some of the data and um, see where they can support our students. Thank you. Uh... I want to start out with before before we can really get into defining uh, what data literacy is. Data itself is just a, is a very broad and encompassing term, and uh, like Chad mentioned, data can when some people think of data, they think of just math. You know, they think of numbers. That can be it can be a quantitative aspect to data. We can be doing things like doing exact measurements in a bio or chemical lab. Um, or it can be something like observation. So we can be observing folks, how they interact in school or how they interact um, in, in a mall or how people are interacting on Zoom <laughs> and how that's changed interacting. So we can observe uh, those things and that's a form of data as well. Or how I constantly have to remind my students uh, is that they are constantly creating data themselves through their tweets or Instagram posts. and when we think about how we analyze and visualize and interpret data, that also changes our definition of how we define data. Um, but no matter what, if it's you know, quantitative data and we're focusing on trying to answer questions about you know, what, when, where, how often, or qualitative data that allows us to get at more of the how and why questions, in short, um, I think that we can define data as information, as bits of information, uh, um, some, some bits more complicated than other bits, <laughs> but um, thinking of data as, as information and, and including that really broad encompassing uh, way we define data and how we analyze and visualize and interpret data. Uh, I wanna start a discussion by asking Akansha and then uh, Natalia and our audience as well, so if you would like to uh, join us in this conversation, feel free to leave your comments and or questions in the Q&A uh, and they'll get, the, that way they can be directed to me. Um, but starting with the Concha and Natalia, what do you think it means to be data literate and what type of data literacy skills should students have? Specifically, um, what do you think are the key components for data literacy for those first year students? Um, thanks, Ashley. So I think being data literate means understanding, creating, critiquing, and communicating with data. And to me, it also means being willing to be curious and brave and asking questions to truly understand the underlying meaning of a data visualization or claims that are being made by the authors. Um, and, you know, data is a powerful tool, so it's important um, 
to know when to use data to make decisions and communicate the meaning with others. Um, and in terms of the data literacy skills that I think students should have, um, definitely I think, you know, programming, uh, statistical knowledge are things, skills that students should have by the time that they graduate from college. But the ability to critically read papers or critique data and figures in the media um, and not being afraid to again ask questions about the data and the methods on how the data were collected or how the data were analyzed in with the software, right? It's not just like this black box, like, you know, you should know the, the algorithms behind that. Um, and also, again, you know, forming their own interpretations of the data that are independent of the interpretations put forth by the authors of the papers. So uh, specifically for um, like first year students, what they should be exposed to, definitely they should be able to tell what is and what is not a valid resource. They should definitely make use of the library services and use search engines to find credible resources and cite papers. And if possible in their first year, definitely they should have practiced reading uh, papers. Um, and math, I think, also plays an important role in data literacy. So um, having math requirements, pre-algebra, algebra, really understanding what the descriptive statistics are, like the mean, median, mode, how those things are visualized, and how those data are communicated to the public. Um, and then also understanding, like, the limitations of each of those things. Um, and then, you know, basics of graphing data on, you know, just like X, Y axis, just like a two, 2D graph. Um, and then in their science classes in first year, um, having a good understanding of how to write a null and an alternative hypothesis, how to collect data, being aware of confounding variables. Um, and then also understanding why having controls are so important in studies. Um, and, you know, again, how to present and communicate with data. So I think those things are it's like my big long answer of what data literacy is and how students um, should get data literacy in their first year. Yeah, thanks, Akanksha. I feel like you covered like so much of what is important. Um, but what I loved about your answer in particular is sort of your focus on that, um, the, the critical lens and sort of being able to see figures or being seen, able to see numbers and recognize like where that's coming from. Um, and I, I, you talked about this, but I think um, we, we do sort of like critiques and look at things, but oftentimes like we don't, we don't, I, I think we can do a better job at sort of helping our students recognize that it comes from like a particular raw data source like right like this this point that you're looking at has gone through some sort of process through some sort of analysis through some sort of manipulation um and being able to understand um and break down like that that step right like so when they look at something like immediately understanding and asking those questions of where did this data source come from who collected it what questions were included like what um what was excluded what design choices were made um and i think you know, to your point about both being a consumer and, and being a creator or designer um, to, to actually like work with data and that being a part of data literacy, um, I, I think that's important. I also, re there's, I feel like there's a little bit of a tension here that because it's, it's they're both like really large um, sort of skills. And I think sometimes we focus on the creation um, or we focus on one or the other, right? And I think I think what I love about your answer is sort of your emphasis on both are really critical and that like that really like it's it's not enough to have students who can open a CSV file, who can um, create a pivot table with their Excel file and create a graph. It's it's really like also the decisions that they're making and the choices um, to really think through that. So um, with you, agree with all of those points. With with everything that you said about, I mean, 
what data literacy should be and what people should be, what specifically what students should be getting out of data literacy. Is there one skill that if you could have students come away with one particular skill that you want students to get out of it the most, what would that be? So um, Ashley, so you're asking in terms of like creating, interpreting, and critiquing a graph or like a visualization, what is like a what it, what is like the most important skill? Yes, yes. Like if you could have students only come if they could only because getting them to you know understand all the intricacies that um, you have laid out, that could be that's almost you know an entire entire methods class or entire methods and statistics course. But if we're trying to reach just first year students and get them exposed, what's something that um, you think that we can capture their attention with and then that's really critical for them moving on? Yeah, in terms of, you know, catching their attention, I think it's really important to like contextualize data literacy um, into like the students' hobbies or like current events. So maybe like, I know TikTok is like the trend these days. So maybe, um, you know, getting students to talk to one another, maybe like, you know, creating like a survey um, so they can like practice collecting data and asking questions. Um, and then, you know, they can start, you know, maybe like graphing data so, you know, like, does the number of cats you have depend on how many cat videos you watch on TikTok, right? Is there a correlation? But then does that imply causation? So I think by getting students to just like ask questions, really immerse themselves into the data will naturally bring out the construction, the interpretation, and the critique. So I don't know if there's just like one in like specific important thing. I think they're all important because they're they all sort of like tie together. That totally makes sense. And it looked like Natalia also wanted to contribute. Oh, I was gonna say, I feel like the, the survey uh, design assignment is one that I see a lot of instructors use. Um, and I, I've seen it be so successful. Um, because it just opens up a lot of questions. Students are so much more engaged. They're designing the questions. Um, it's very hands-on learning, um, which also means there's a lot of like trial and error. Uh, you'll have students really understand like why it matters, what kinds of questions you ask and how to, how to work with messy data. Um, and and they're, they're finding those questions, right? As they're working, because they're like, I wanna know this the answer to this question. I wanna know how to visualize it and present it. And so they like have to go through this like very um, tedious process that like oftentimes can be really boring to just learn about. Like if you're, if you're just learning a lecture, it's like, well, why am I gonna clean a data set? Um, but, it's, but it's so much more engaging for them. Um, so I don't, I don't know that that's like the, the I, I agree, like, I don't know that there's like this one takeaway, but I will say like, there are these, there are certain assignments that are so um, engaging that I think they end up um, having students um, grapple with a lot of major questions. And I've seen that um, in, in the comments that uh, their attendees also agree that, th that it needs to be something engaging and, uh, they're also supporting the idea of making sure that students can be critical. And so I think that's a theme is that making sure that students understand data and how it can be used, but also that they can be critical of those sources of data, how it was collected and who, who does that uh, data rep actually represent. So talking about data literacy, one of the things that is important as we, as we start with this initiative is to put into context of why, why data literacy is important and why is it something that we should be focusing on. And I wanna go to Tiffany. Um, coming from the biomedical field, how has the pandemic highlighted the importance of data, uh, sorry, uh, importance of data literacy in regards to medicine? 
And in particular, are there things that you think are important for students to understand when it comes to biomedical data? Um, that's a good question. I think um, to start off, we just need to understand just a very basic idea um, that we're dealing with the intersection between biology and, and medicine um, and how we might respond um, to diseases and medications, environmental um, onslaughts and things of that nature. Um, it's important to keep that into context. Um, and as we consider what's going on right now, one of the basic things that I think that is necessary is just a very fundamental understanding of what health literacy is um, and an understanding of what that means and how that ushers in um, aspects of our own health, um, various social determinants of health as well um, and thinking about that. I know one of the things that at the very beginning of the pandemic that struck me was the fact that health disparities exist, um, you know, and they exist sometimes through no fault of an individual's own um, and then also just because of um, equity issues um, that may may happen or occur and and I won't get into the weeds of any of that but um, obviously we right now we have a, a disease that that sort of takes advantage takes opportunity of those that do have certain um, health issues um, and so those things are important um, and highlight the importance of having good health literacy and understanding how we can take the information that's out there and use it um, to make better health decisions for ourselves and for our families. Um, and so whether it's just some basic information on how to better control our blood pressure, blood sugar, um, things of that nature, um, on down to some of the more important critical things when we talk about heart disease and things like that. Um, so it does become very important to keep those things in mind because we're dealing, unfortunately, with um, something that right now there's no cure for. Um, and we just have some very um, um, basic um, mitigation efforts of distancing and masking at this point that we can all do to sort of help. But I think when it comes down to sort of um, some things that people can sort of keep in mind, um, when it comes to this is the idea that everyone is different. Um, that there's a lot of overlap in what our genetic makeup looks like, but the differences really do pinpoint and highlight how we respond to certain things. Um, and so um, right now we have a disease where people can be asymptomatic, but still spread. Um, and that asymptomatic spread is a large part of why we have the high numbers of cases that we do. And unfortunately also the high number of deaths that we do as a result. Um, and so there is this thought I know early on um, that it didn't impact the younger generation. Um, and so it was just something that was more prevalent and more deadly um, in the, the elderly population. But the more information we found and the more that time went on, we found that that's not necessarily the case. Um, and so I know a lot of people were saying, well, if I get it, I'll just you'll be OK. But that was a very, um, very bad <laughs> mentality to go in with it, because, again, everyone is different. So you don't know how one person is going to respond versus the next one. And it is just these basic, very basic things when it comes down to our makeup and, and how we're dealing with that, how our bodies react and respond to that. Um, and so also in keeping in mind that the environment plays a big role in, in things as well um, and how our genes are impacted and how our health is impacted. And so all of these things play a huge part in um, our susceptibility. Um, and our risk for developing severe disease versus non-symptomatic or asymptomatic disease. Um, just in general, whether we're talking about uh, uh, coronavirus or we're talking about um, things like asthma or, or things that, that you know, are, are prevalent every day um, that we're around and will be around after uh, coronavirus is, is hopefully a thing of the past. Um, you know, but these things are kind of what would come to the forefront, just some very basic um, knowledge of, of what health literacy can do, um, what it means to be able to have a better understanding of the material that's out there and how we can use it to make better choices um, for our own health um, and the health of our loved ones. Yes, thank you. And I, one of, I think it, one of the things that you're getting at is how data literacy can impact how people have interpreted what information that's come, been coming out about the pandemic and whether they have 
you know, whether they believe the data or whether they, how, how they're interpreting that, that information is influenced by their data literacy. Um, in, with the pandemic and, and, and how, what Tiffany has, has discussed, we walked in, we've been hearing this phrase now more than ever. This is not a new phrase, but we have been hearing it um, more um, with a pandemic. And so when I'm th when thinking about data literacy, I kind of want to lean into that trope for a moment, the now more than ever trope. And so I want to go to Chad um, and I want to direct this question to Chad first, but it's also open again, as always, to all the other panelists and, and to our audience. Um, why is data literacy important you know, right now more than ever? Great. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I guess this is picking up on something that Tiffany just discussed in the idea that um, there needs to be more of an understanding of uh, data, where data is coming from. I think most of the panelists here talked about the origins of data being critical and questioning um, how the data is being generated, collected, um, who is it being collected from, and so on and so forth. Um, there was a there was a, a joke, um, but there is a bunch of reality um, in what what this joke uh, meant was the uh, kind of the social data that's being generated as well. Data is being collected and generated, um, you know, uh, second by second. There is just terabytes of data that is being, I, I think terabytes might be, be the wrong uh, terminology at this point, but there is just a lot of data that is being correct, collected on a lot of these social media sites um, and then being analyzed where machine learning or artificial intelligence algorithms are being ran on, on us. Right. And decisions are being made and, and um, market marketing advertisements are being created um, to to target directly to us. And um, what tends to happen in these types of situations is we view things um, that is geared towards us. We do not see what's on the other side of that. The other people see what's on the other side of that. And what tends to happen is we have, we have groupings of peoples. We have uh, tribes that are being created where um, people believe the things that they are being told. And this is where the idea um, and the importance of data literacy comes in. It's being able to question um, some of the data that's being presented to you, whether it's being um, masked as an advertisement or whether it's it's a it's a graph that is directly in front of you. Um, I you know I, I remember back in um, my junior high school and even high school when we used to analyze graphs in our history classes and we used to look at the bias in those graphs. Right, um, this has been in existence for for a very very long time. Um, today it's coming faster. It's it's more rapid. Um, they could be a lot more biased. Um, there's a lot of money to be made um, from advertisers when um, they know exactly what we like and we don't we no longer have to question um, where we can get things from. Um, and that is, is, is a serious issue. Um, even though there's a lot of convenience with that, there's that's a serious issue and that continues uh, to, there needs to be a continuation of um, uh, criticism and, and critical thinking around what data is being presented to you. I can, um, I'll just add like sort of attach to that, like as someone who worked at a small, at like smaller nonprofits, right? Like you, like the flip side of that, right? Too is um, the students that we're working with and the people that we're training up are people who are gonna sort of um, be at that point of like having to make decisions and having to collect data, right? And so like introducing those students, not like being able to, to understand like bias and data collection and sort of data and, and data security issues is really important too from the perspective of like if they are going to be the people creating and sort of managing and collecting it um even even from like a really well-intentioned place there may be ways that like they are um contributing to sort of um ongoing uh bias data collection or just like collecting data and saving it in places where people who are already in really vulnerable situations um, are put in even further more vulnerable situations. Um, and so that that is sort of another piece to, to what Chad just sort of shared. And that brings us up um, to a question that uh, Muhammad uh, Koskin has, has written in 
um, about ethics and algorithms. And uh, in particularly, they mention uh, at the book Weapons of uh, Math Destruction and how, how should we go about and should we be including um, ethics as we build uh, Padlet programs? How should we be including ethics around algorithms and ethics around data as we build these data literacy programs? Uh, Chad, did you want to, to answer that? Sure, uh, just finished reading that book for a second time. So I'm um, familiar with some of the ideas there. Um, so uh, yeah, certainly, absolutely. I, I mean, um, I would, you know, I, I like to think that I'm an ethical person. Um, I like to think that a lot of my ideologies and my ideas um, lead to me making the best decisions around um, supporting and um, you know analyzing data that that is being created by people. Um, but at the same time, I think that there needs to be this continuation of education, right? I think that um, ethics should lay the foundation of what we do with uh, data and data analysis, right? Um, I think in some of the classes. Uh, we we get sometimes we get you know uh, pristine data right a, a pristine data set where we don't have to question where it comes from uh, we don't have to um, you know kind of wrangle the data and clean the data right so there's a reduced number of questions that are being asked of that data set but you know if there can be an introduction of hey you know this data is coming from you know students in uh, um, you know younger students in um, a particular community. Right. Um, there, there's some rules. There's some laws around, you know, how we collect this data, why we collect this data, and how to protect, you know, students of this data. Right. Um, so we need to we need to always be thinking about um, how we we think about ethics when it comes to not only the use of the data, but also how we go and analyze the data to then present it to people that just may not be aware of how the analysis was completed. Thank you. Um, I, I want to go on to um, talking about what you were just mentioned about, you know, visualization of the data, how people are viewing the data. And I want to go back to Akansha. Um, your research has been focused on how people use and understand data through graphs. And I wondered what are some key components that you've noticed that students struggle with? Since graphs tend to be one of our uh, you know, number way, one ways that we visualize information uh, or visualize data, what are some key concepts that you think that students tend to struggle with? And how do you think data visualizations can be used as a way to introduce data literacy? And of course, I'm directing this to a concha first, but um, any of the other panelists can weigh in on this as well, as well as um, our attendees. Thanks, Ashley. So I think, so thinking about difficulties with graphing, um, the literature goes back as far as 30 years. Uh, documenting difficulties with students in K through 12, um, pre-service teachers, undergraduate students, and even professionals um, about, you know, areas that they struggle in with construction and interpretation. And the literature is just full of everything from, um, you know, lack of knowledge on graph mechanics to not understanding that, you know, you can't use a bar graph to plot every single type of data, right? So under having that understanding of different types of graphs that are out there. Um, understanding statistics, that's a big one. Um, I've had students, when I put error bars on like a bar graph, they ask me what the capital I is. Um, so they just, they don't know what that means. So um, the descriptive stats. Um, and then there are also challenges with just software in general. Um, so the one finding that I found from my dissertation work that we can actually help students in the classroom with, and again, my dissertation work was with experts and novices, is um, that you know students tend to struggle with just the general thought process that experts have down from their you know years of experience working with data making graphs um, and also I'm just defining experts in the study there were professors who have had extensive research and teaching experience 
so I did this think aloud study that I'll just quickly tell you about. And it was just pen and paper study. So, you know, having to do the technology component, that just adds layers of more complexity. I just sort of wanted to focus on how were they thinking about data? Um, and so I just gave them a table of raw values. And what the students did is just with their instincts, they just automatically jumped to creating a graph without even reading the prompt or establishing what the purpose or what the question were in the first place. The experts, however, they spent a few minutes really thinking about what the general question was and what they really wanted to portray from the data. The students also tended to plot all of the raw data because they felt like if they missed, if they left out some data points, that they would lose points. Um, the experts, however, they tended to plot only the data that aligned with their purpose. Um, and although students didn't really have a well thought out structure or process to translating data from the raw form into a graph, the graphs they did create um, had all of the axis labels, they had titles, um, and students also gave a lot of attention to the aesthetics. They were really worried about the color and the design of the graph and not so much the content of the graph and the data that the graph was uh, portraying. The expert graphs were very minimalistic uh, and you know they were just bare sketches because for experts, sketching a graph is the first step in their thought process. And this is what they do before they translate their graph over into a graphing software, which is their final product. And so to help students segue their thinking to that of an expert, um, we developed and published um, a step-by-step -step guide to graph construction. And it actually guides students in, across three phases. So first is like a planning phase. And students are asked probing questions like, you know, what are you trying to do? What are your variables? What type of graph do you want to make? Do you want to manipulate your data? Um, and then the second part of this step-by-step -step guide is walking students through the actual construction portion of the graph. So making sure that, you know, your graph has the appropriate scale the units, the labels, the title, the key, the sample size. And then the very last portion of this guide is a reflection piece. So having students, you know, just pause and think about what did they just make? Does it align with their intended purpose? Um, and then also, you know, what are other ways that they could have grasped these data? Um, and you know, asking students to really think about what the advantages are of their graph and what the disadvantages are. You know, what information does their graph not portray? And I think asking these reflective questions will give students the confidence they need so that when they see a graph in media um, or, you know, in a textbook, then they can, you know, just have these questions and they can just, you know, have that automatic process that experts have with years of experience. That's, I think that's very interesting. And I really like that you point out that although we think of, and one of the things that we have to kind of overcome is figuring out where students are, are at when we, and how to meet them. But the fact that students were already even if they weren't, you know, didn't know about the actual data and that's not what their focus was on, they knew they wanted to make the graph look good and they wanted to include all the amount, all of the information as they could. While the experts are just honing in on what was important to them, they're already starting with this open perspective of, I want, you know, to include everything. And so I think that's a really, I think that's a really positive way to look at student as students as not being not that they don't know something but they're already bringing something there and um building off of that i wanted to ask uh natalia and about are there types of and so i know so natalia has been working 
uh, at North Carolina State University to uh, expand data literacy programming specifically to undergraduate students. And so I wanted to hear from you about the strategies that you've been using to gain student involvement, and also if there are particular types of data, data analysis, or data visualizations that are more appealing uh, to first-year students. Yeah. Um, so at NC State, similar to what we see, um, what Brian shared about um, and sort of, or not Brian, sorry, Mandy, um, shared about sort of our numbers, right? Like, so we, uh, about two and a half years ago, um, I came on board and, and one of the things that was like sort of amazing was we had this like high demand for um, data and visualization workshops and sort of consultations. Um, and unsurprisingly, like the vast majority of that was coming from graduate students and from faculty. Um, and we already heard from Mandy, like sort of the reasons why there's, they're working on research there. Um, there's a, a very clear need or point of need um, there. And so with our undergrads, we saw um, weren't necessarily attending workshops, um, weren't really coming to the library for data services, um, but we know that there's a need, right? <laughs> um, and, and so for us, it was about trying to figure out what the strategy is um, to, to tap into those students who, as we all know, undergrads are incredibly busy. I mean, all of our students are incredibly busy, but undergraduates um, sort of are overly committed, even if, regardless of where they're at, right? Like whether it's because they have jobs, whether it's because they're in extracurricular activities, um, whether it's because of family sort of situations, um, undergrads are have a ton to take care of. And so coming to the library for an additional workshop is just not high priority. Um, and that's understandable. <laughs> um, and so for us, like the, the approach that um, I took was really to build out our embedded instruction. Um, and so I reached out to um, working with the subject specialists at our library, reached out to a number of faculty, um, sort of found different key departments and courses that I thought would really benefit from um, data support and, and sort of one shot or two shot instructions um, and started just meeting with faculty to learn more about their students, learn more about their needs. Um, and just started getting a lot of instruction requests. Um, and so over the last two and a half years, like our instruction requests, particularly with undergrads has grown significantly. Um, and, and, and the approach for this though, is like, that's not the end, right? Like for me, in some ways, building out this course embedded instruction was really kind of attached to like, an informal exploratory needs assessment. Um, I wanted to be able to be in front of a classroom and engage with students. Um, I, um, my teaching approach is definitely very um, participatory and active, um, does a lot of active learning in it. Um, and so I do a lot of informal assessment. Um, I hear a lot from students. Um, and so it's been great because I get to hear a lot of feedback and then respond to that and tweak um, sort of my whatever instruction we offer um, based on those needs. Um, and so that's been really great in terms of getting a lot of just like feedback about what students need. Um, and overwhelmingly students um, really need these services and need the support. Um, they're always like, I never learned this. Um, I had like, who, like we were never taught how to do this. Um, and they're always just like really surprised. Um, even just like working with like juniors or seniors, they're just like, oh my gosh, like I didn't know this existed. Um, and so that's always, you know, unfortunate, but always exciting um, to sort of build off of that. Um, and so, so from there, there's like wanting to build out a couple of different kinds of programs. Um, I have a number of things that I have like on the back of my mind, like back burners of um, programs where like we get to go um, really to where the students are at. Um, and so this is this is a little bit of like my community organizing training coming to light. Um, I was very much trained that like we go to our constituents, we go to our community. Um, we don't necessarily ask them at, at first to come to us um, because it's harder. Um, and so I, I'm really focusing on building out relationships um, with existing sort of campus partners. Um, so uh, McNair Scholars, Office of Undergraduate Research, um, Women and Minorities in Engineering, um, we've built out so, um, partnerships with all of these groups and sort of get asked 
now to come do sessions with them and students now are like really starting to understand and know that they can come to the library for this help. Um, and so we're really, I think, trying to, to build off of that. Um, and then I think you, you sort of asked a little bit about like specific activities. Um, so I, I think, you know, I was gonna say like the survey activity um, isn't necessarily something we design, but it's something we support. Um, and I think it's been very successful at engaging students. Um, I think there are other activities um, that I can think of. Um, so we have access, we have a subscription to this tool called Social Explorer, um, which is a essentially a mapping tool um, that gives students access to um, a, a lot of data, but like census data is like their core thing that they make it really easy and user-friendly. Um, so it is a paid subscription tool. Um, so I feel like it would be interesting to adapt this activity, but one way we approach that is um, we actually have students download data um, about schools in their counties that they're from um, in a different tool. And so then they're able to, to talk a little bit more about like how to find data in the wild and like learning about metadata, learning about file formats. Um, it's always fascinating to me how students um, don't know, um, like I'll ask like, do you, have you used a CSV file before? Like, do you know what a CSV file? And they'll like generally be like, no. And I'll be like, you probably have, right? And then we open it and they're like, oh, this is so familiar. Um, and so we talk through that. Um, and then we'll go a little bit over like uh, very basic spatial data, right? Having latitude and longitudes. And then they're able to upload it onto this tool where they can then create this two layer map um, of data that's like pretty personal to them, right? Like they know where these schools are. Um, and, and, and then they're able to see sort of the demographic data in the background um, and personalize it. Um, and so I feel like that's, activities like that have been pretty successful. Um, and we've already, I, I think the pan, like various panelists have talked about like personal, personalized data, data that's like real. Um, Cause sometimes I, I think when people think about data, it just looks like numbers on a table, right? Like that's what their instinct is. Um, but when you really bring it to life, that I think is what often um, really draws our students in. Yes, I think those are, those are very good points. Um, and I've just lost where the question was, but I know that one of, so, someone, <laughs> someone of the attendees had mentioned how, how much pushback or if anyone has gotten pushback trying to get faculty members to incorporate more data visualizations into their teaching. And I think that's one of a great way to do it, especially you know, through something like Social Explorer where you're using um, mapping. And I know that that's something that I've done. I teach social problems and it's a great way to get students engaged with data to show them a map of you know, the United States and then zoom in for, since I'm in Georgia to Georgia and then specifically into Atlanta and then have them go look at you know, their hometown and how does this uh, social problem affect you know, where they're from. That can be a great, great way to get engagement with students. Um, so an, another question from the audience, this is from Julia. Uh, they say, of course, it's important to question data, data visualizations, et cetera, uh, but too much emphasis on being critical of data can lead to students deciding that it's all lies, <laughs> all lies, damn lies and statistics, um, <laughs> to quote that, and to just writing off quantitative information. And so, how do you find a balance between encouraging critical thought about data while still encouraging students to trust and use data that is trustworthy? I think that kind of also goes back to what Tiffany was talking about with um, data related to COVID-19 and how we want people to, to trust, trust the data and information so that way they follow these the healthcare advice related to it. Um, but we also want to teach our students to be critical of data. So how do we balance that? Tiffany, did you want to start out that open to any of the panel members? Sure, I'll jump in um, and get started. I think, um, you know, it is important. And one of the things that in, in graduate school that we learned is, is um, 
just the ability to think critically, um, to be able to look at information and to be able to ask the right questions to better understand it, and also to convey what it says. Um, so these things are very important and these are skills um, that, that cross so many different um, areas of, of, of knowledge. And so um, it is important. And, and I mean, even just some very basic things as a child growing up to be able to be independent um, and not have someone have to kind of walk you through life in, in, in essence. And so um, those things are, are very essential to, to life and to understanding. But at the same time, um, like the, the individual said, there has to be a balance, a necessary balance, um, because you know, we, we live in a time right now, unfortunately, where there's a lot of misinformation. Um, there's a lot of information that is being put out that that is um, just untrue. Um, and, and, and that's the nicest way I can put it. It is very untrue. Um, and so the thing is, though, is we need to really be able to understand and know the sources of credible information um, as we start to look for information and start to do these studies and put out this data. Um, my go-to resource a lot of times are some of the databases within the, the NCBI or, or the National Center for Biotechnology and Information, um, that suite of, of databases that they have. So from literature um, sources, um, published peer-reviewed articles to um, data sets um, that have been collected from a lot of high throughput studies and things of that nature. Um, one of the things that Patty Brennan, who was the director of the National Library of Medicine that houses the uh, NCBI suite of databases has said, um, is that they want NCBI, the National Library of Medicine to become the trusted source of information. Um, and so what I'm getting at is that we need to know what those trusted sources of information are. Um, and we also need to be able to understand um, that unfortunately some people are going to put out information that suits their own purpose. Um, that um, make them look good or, or take away from um, other things. And so we need to be able to understand that in essence um, and really be able to gauge and vet the information that we're looking at from a critical lens of understanding how it was derived um, and being able to really be able to say this study is a solid study. Um, they've done the homework to be able to figure out um, the necessary tools and necessary um, basis to be able to um, get the, the right measures to get the outcomes um, and be able to say that this is a true and valid outcome that we've gotten um, based on the analysis that we've done, um, but also understanding that um, there needs to be some very basic things going in at the front of the study um, when it comes to deciding the study design um, and, and things um, of certain critical numbers that need to be reached to be able to say that this study was a valid study, inclusivity um, within the study and understanding, like I said, very fundamental uh, idea that everyone is different. Um, and so making sure that that sample uh, population that you're using or whatever you're using does take that into account as well. Um, there does need to be a balance, absolutely. Um, but at the same time, also knowing and understanding those sources of, of good and good and quality information. Um, you know, I think some of us may be more or less prone to question some data more than others. Um, but at the same time, just being able to have that skill set um, is important in uh, going forward, especially in this time where there's so much information, like Chad said, um, just is being put out. Um, and uh, it's, it's just a ridiculous amount of information that's being put out. Um, and so being able to vet it and being able to fully be able to say that this is good quality information is, is important. Um, but at the same time, realizing that there are sources of good quality information out there that you don't have to really question, you just can trust it. And I think that gets us, oh, sorry, Akancha, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna add to uh, what Tiffany said um, and also what Chad uh, uh, said earlier about you know marketing that I think that, you know, it's really important to make sure that students know, you know, the graphs that focus only on aesthetics for, you know, marketing purposes and trying to sell a product, as opposed to graphs that are focused solely on the data and just trying to separate those out. Um, and then also, um, I think in the question was, you know, how, 
with students, if they're being overly critical, how can you sort of like balance that out with their interest in learning? Um, what I do is I tell students, okay, well, you know, you gave your critique, now it's your turn. How would you improve this graph? I want you to create it and I want you to provide justifications for your thought process. And, you know, students really like that. And based, based on what we've talked about so far in regards to data literacy, I think that we could argue that data literacy by itself is in the public interest. It is part of the public good. So fostering data literacy is fostering an informed, an informed public. And therefore, you know, just data literacy and, and fostering that in a way uh, is part of the public good. But I wanna think about other ways um, that are, other ways that equipping students with data literacy tools can be used to further public interest projects. And I think this kind of also links with um, our underlining goal of wanting to make sure that equity, diversity, inclusion, and inclusion underline our goals for creating these data literacy programs. And so I think that there's a, a good intersection between how do we make sure that equipping students with data literacy can be used as a tool for um, you know, public interest projects, but also that we're making sure that we're incorporating uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion through these programs. And I first wanted to go to Natalia, but this is also open to everyone um, on the panel, as well as those who, who are attending. Um, you can leave your, or put your questions or comments in the Q&A section. Yeah, so how do we make sure that sort of equity, diversity, um, and inclusion are underlined in these efforts? Um, I, so I think, and, and I'll be interested in hearing um, everyone else's input, but I think there's this sort of two, two things that I think about in particular are, um, and I don't, I don't know if this phrasing is like the, the best, but like it's the, we need more people at the table, right? Like we, we've been talking about this for a really long time. Um, and I feel like that's, that's sort of our focus. And I, I, I think that's just, there, there is no question around that. I like, agree. We need more people at the table. We need um, diverse sort of perspectives and broader perspectives and voices. Um, and we need to, we need to make a real effort to sort of invite and bring people in. Um, and, and lower barriers to entry. Like I think particularly within data science and like the data world, I think we create a lot of barriers and sort of prereqs that we ask um, before people can come in and sort of engage. Um, I know I know my own personal experience is sort of, um, it, it, it can be really daunting and, and challenging sometimes. Um, to because like data is such a big world right like you there's so much expertise um and so much layers and different um ways that you can approach it that like it it is challenging i think um it, and and because like i think it comes with this sort of um the sense of the i just i i think the it, it can feel very um, strict and sort of objective, right? And not, um, and, and I don't mean objective in like a, just sort of, it, it can feel like there's not a lot of space for sort of creativity and sort of critical thinking, which is why I think this panel is really exciting um, to talk about sort of, that, that's a really critical part of um, working with data. Um, so definitely like more people at the table. Um, I think one thing we don't talk about enough is this idea of, keeping people engaged and, and retention, right? Um, and sort of how do we ensure that the folks who are invited or who come into the space um, or who we who want to be in the space and like haven't been able to gain access into it, like how do we ensure um, that they they are able to participate and are heard? Um, how do we sort of ensure that, that the spaces we create are um, open to different kinds of um, thinking and, and open to experimenting. Um, and I think, you know, within specifically around teaching, like I feel like this is a really core reason of why I believe in active learning, why I believe in participatory 
um, environments and why I believe in like informal assessment, um, having students really come in and sort of drive, um, drive their learning. And I think um, it helps with, with removing sort of these assumptions we make. Um, and so I've been in, I've been in rooms where, and well-intentioned, kind people, right, um, have a lot of assumptions about the kinds of things that first year college students should know, right? So um, I've been in rooms where people say like, well, they learned how to use spreadsheets in Excel um, in high school. Like that's something they go over. Um, and so there's this assumption um, and already there's this like barrier to entry, right? So you have students come in and then they feel like they feel like they can't participate. They feel like they are already behind and then they don't wanna say it. Um, and then it's, it's just like, this door that's being closed um, instead of sort of an invitation and, and being open to people being at different levels and sort of different understanding and still being able to contribute um, and bring their own perspective and view. Um, so I think that's a very long winded answer, but like one, one thing in terms of teaching, like I, I really truly believe that we need to um, make space um, for our teaching to be really engaging um, and sort of um, and adapt, adapt to like our students' needs and where they're at. Um, Natalia, you hit on some things that are, are very near and dear to my heart um, and a lot of um, why I was attracted to the Piglet um, initiative to start with. Um, the idea that the underlying goal is to focus on underrepresented students and to create that pipeline in, into those careers um, it is something that is very, very prominent and, and important for me. Um, being a minority in this space, um, it's not always the easiest to navigate, to be honest. Um, you know, we hear the idea and the, the, the phrase that representation matters, um, and it's not trivial. It's not trivial by any means. Um, just being able to have a seat at the table um, it opens up new worlds, new possibilities, new ideologies, um, new, new cultures, um, and things to be considered um, when it comes to whatever's being discussed at the table. Um, and so having individuals with this different um, mind frame, different life experience, um, be able to sit down and converse with the majority and usher these ideas into the conversation and make them prevalent and relevant to the conversation is important. Um, so when you think about that in the context of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, what happens is you start to create um, that kind of mind frame where people that look like me um, were not the exception. You know, it's the norm. Um, and so um, the ability to be able to do this and to be able to utilize the skill set um, that Pidlet is going to offer and those of us in this career field um, uh, that surrounds data um, to be able to do that and to be able to bring in and usher in um, the next generation of scientists, the next generation of, of data competent individuals. Um, it's an honor and it's also a necessity um, when, when you think about it. Um, um, I think it was already talked about in, in looking at the, the misinformation or when we look at data science and um, AI, artificial intelligence, um, and how there's often a misrepresentation or, or just a lack of representation um, of, of individuals of color or minorities in certain studies and, and just how um, the computer is being able to see these ideas and these images and be able to make these um, guesses and, and um, bring, out, bring forward this data. And then when you come to clinical trials um, and the, the lack of representation of minorities in clinical trials, all of these play a part. Um, when we think about um, diversity, equity, inclusion issues, and we think about um, how it surrounds data for the public good, um, we have, um, there's the program, All of Us program, that's being facilitated um, by the NIH, which the, the purpose of that is to be able to bring in a million individuals um, to be able to look at their genomic makeup and, and various other um, components of their health and being able to create this large data set that is very diverse, um, that can actually be able to pinpoint and identify risk for disease um, for individuals and using that data um, to be able to um, make predictions for individuals. 
on that basis. But for this to work for the general population, it needs more minorities. It needs more of those that are not typically represented for it to really be able to do what it needs to do. And so when we think about things like that, um, when we think about these projects, we think about having the seat at the table, um, representation, all of this plays a part in it. Um, and so um, I just, I love that question. Um, obviously I've got a passion of, um, centered around that, but you know, because I do, um, I, I've had enough, um, experiences for better or worse, um, having being the only at the table. Um, and so I think it is important for programs like this to move forward and to try to usher in um, newer generations of people into the data field so that it is not the exception, but more so the norm. I just wanted to, uh, if it's okay, if I can just continue uh, the conversation around that question. Um, I love this idea of having more diversity at the table, um, being able to not only help inform decisions that are being made, but also get into this idea or um, this process of how algorithms are being developed as well, right? We talked earlier about you know places like Facebook and Twitter and, and social media sites that leverage a lot of these algorithms for, um, for their good, for their purposes. Um, but sometimes uh, the folks that are, are developing these algorithms, algorithms and running the analysis uh, analyses are uh, uh, people that lurk, look uh, a certain way from a certain community. Um, the more people that we can get um, literate, data literate, more people that we can get into these fields, get these, get these types of experiences, the more people that will be sitting at that table, the more people that can help inform um, better decision making on how these algorithms are developed and how they're, they're being deployed um, to the population, right? Um, sometimes the people that work on it don't represent the population. Um, another thing too, and, and something that I wanted to kind of circle back to is uh, how I got to be a part of this, com this, this wonderful conversation is that um, one of my colleague, uh, Jackie Slayton, who is, um, who is a director or, or who, who leads our learning community um, and, and runs our Digital Learners to Leaders program, um, kind of introduced me <laughs> to, this, to this group here. And, and what, the, what the Digital Learners to Leaders program is, is, is it's a grant funded program um, it's interdisciplinary, it ex it's uh, experiential learning, um, it's to enhance the skills and the abilities of our Georgia State students, who is, is a diverse uh, group of students. And a lot of things that um, these students are doing, they're getting real world um, examples, people that are coming from the field similar to, to um, you know, data in ATL with uh, with what Brian referenced earlier is we're, we're getting people from the field to come teach some of these classes. Um, you know, some of these students are getting some, some questions and problems that are coming from the field. Um, and they're working on these and they're experimenting and they're testing ideas and they're um, pre cre creating uh, products um, that they will then take to the community, their communities, um, and then make changes, hopefully make changes within their communities, but they're more knowledgeable about things that um, impact their communities and things that they're developing. And now they're gonna have a say at, you know, starting at a young age, but as they enter the field, they, they know how to have these conversations. They know how to create change. They know how to create products that will uh, influence and impact um, their community. Um, and, you know, having more people um, that represent the diverse background, particularly in, in data and data science, um, I think will will then change uh, the way that communities look in the future. Thank you. I I think everything that everyone has said so far, and based on what the the comments we've had, is specifically from Kalila and Catherine about not not only is it um, you know diversifying and uh, bringing more people to the table, getting more people educated about data literacy and therefore um, you know building that that pipeline to these to these careers but also taking those skills and while students are learning those skills to the community so both Kalia and Catherine mentioned the importance of uh, one of the importance of addressing uh, diversity and inclusion is making sure that you're using those critical understanding of data and bringing it to folks in the community as well. 
Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Uh, there are so many more great questions and comments that the attendees have given us. And I know there's more that the panel would love to discuss. So I wanna thank um, everyone for their feedback and um, I'm gonna hand it over to Brian. He's gonna tell you how to get in contact with us so we can continue these conversations. And I thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, thank you everyone. This was a this was our first conversation and the the chat and the QA has been QA has really been very lively. So sorry we didn't get to all your questions, but we do want you to reach out to us. Um, I want to just address real quick if I can, Khalila's comment about connecting it with community. She uh, mentioned the Civic Switchboard and Neighborhood Nexus and some of these portals that are empowering communities. We are very much interested in connecting, as, as Ashley mentioned, data literacy to the community and also K through 12. That's, a, that's down the road, but we are interested in all that. So for a later webinar. <laughs> so so um, thank you, Ashley. Thank you, New America. Thank you, Pitt UN. Thank you, everyone. If you enjoyed our conversation today, please go to newamerica.org slash events and sign up for other ones. They're all great. Uh, we're all like-minded here. But as far as us, we want to hear from you. We did not respond to every one of you. And again, sorry about that, but uh, Google us, Pidlit, P-I-D-L-I-T. -I, I think it'll be your first hit besides Pedialyte, the, uh, the uh, beverage. You'll, it'll be the second one, Pidlit. Google us, please, and reach out to us. We are on Twitter, so get on that bandwagon. Twitter can be used for good, not just for bad. Twitter is good sometimes. Get on Twitter. Uh, we are at Get Pidlet. So reach out to us that way. And you can Google any one of us and find our contact information at Georgia State. This will be available on YouTube. And so, uh, and while you're at it, follow New America PIT as well. We're all, we're all, it's all good stuff. So thank you all so much. And is there anything I forgot to say, Ashley? Is there anything in closing? We have another minute. I uh, know. Uh, thank you. Uh, you can. I'll leave it to Alberto if Alberto wanted to add anything to end it. No, this was a great conversation and we look forward to, to continuing it. So uh, hit us up on Twitter. We, we can get the conversation going and please also uh, reach us out on our website and keep an eye for future conversations. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.